Welcome to the Critcast, which is what I believe the name currently is. It seems to change every week, but here we are with the Critcast. Uh, we're here to bring you the latest in gaming and pop culture news. I'm joined today by a very good friend of mine and the man who happens to look at all my words and tell me that only some of them are bad. Uh, Darren Bontes, please, could you introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. And yes, it is indeed true. Democracy has prevailed. The name of this podcast is now The Critcast. And just by by the way, every bowl of The Critcast now comes with more human teeth for that extra nutritional flavor. Do the, uh, Usually, Darren, I let you just go with whatever fun uh, stinger you want to throw here. But are you implying that the listeners need to... Um, eat the teeth that we provide them oh yeah i mean don't you <laughs> well okay um last time i ate a tooth i'd take a quick short trip to the dentist it was incidentally mine but that's got nothing to do with it see win win darren how was your, how's your week been? it's been busy it has been hot but it has been a really interesting week you know just in terms of gaming in terms of what we've been playing what we've been watching very fascinating stuff yeah i'd look I, as, as much as i want to talk about your your week i think think there are more important matters to attend to and because i feel like we're going to talk about it a lot that is the matter of hitman brad we have discussed this it is not hitman <laughs> it is hit man it's it's hitman and i will hear absolutely not it is hitman Listen, i don't care what excuses you bring to the M table i will not sully the name of a fantastic video game franchise with something that sounds vaguely familiar to that absolute European trash that is Moomin. It's interesting that you go for Moomin when I feel like most people would go for Pikmin. I, I've got problems. <laughs> Clearly. But okay, well, I before we get into the thick of things, you know that you know that superhero who like has the red, white look yeah, uh, the big white eyes. What's what's his name? Big white eyes. What? Yeah, that, uh, that superhero. He's, he's got the he's got like the the spider webbing over his over his costume. Oh, Spider Man. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's Spider Man, is it no, not? It's Spider Man. It's Spider Man. No one says Spider Man. <laughs> Just like it's Batman and Superman. Oh my God! I wish I could strangle you right now. <laughs> I I am filled with all kinds of rage. It's it's this is worse than when I've accidentally touched a carton of yogurt. Well, stop the podcast now. We're going to talk about that. Why did you get enraged by your yogurt? Well, I mean, there's two factors here. One, I hate how British people pronounce it as yog yogurt, and two. Oh yes, yogurt. It, too, I I just hate yogurt. It, it, it freaks me out. I I can't touch a carton of it without you know having this this feeling that I've been tainted by it. It's I mean yogurt is just sort of thicker milk. It is gross milk. It's it is expired <laughs> milk. Do you who drinks expired milk? Huh? 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 It's not expired milk. It's made in a particular way that makes it a bit thicker. God, your face is a bit thicker. I mean, listen. I, I know I have been keeping up to the diet plan, but then, wow, that was a bit of a low yeah, blade. The it? two things I cannot <laughs> handle touching in container form is yogurt and tomato sauce tomato sauce i can actually back you on that i feel like tomato sauce is highly overrated Ooh, i just i just feel like when i touch that bottle like it's just going to crack it's going to pour all over my hands and then yeah, i have yeah. to go run you know screaming and you know set myself on fire the worst part about tomato sauce is if you let it sit for too long and then like the actual sort of like liquid of the sauce like separates from the tomato uh. bit, so it's just like <laughs> like pink water that you score oh. oh i was just dreading the idea of playing the the medium next week but this is just even more horrifying oh, no oh, i actually need to play that as well you know what we don't need to play well i i, I need to play it a bit more but i feel like you've played oh. uh, more than your fair share is um hitman 3 i'm not i'm not giving it up it's hitman mm, i'm just going to block that that memory from my brain with a hammer fine fine for for, for, for the sake of you i'll call it hitman whatever oh thank you <laughs> hitman 3 darren you are a hitman expert i want you to, i want you to tell me if hitman 3 is good or not because i have a, a, an idea of what it is well according to one devilishly handsome reviewer on critical hit whose name is exactly the same as mine it's good it is so damn good my friends it's excellent i've been playing i think i'm about 
I've just finished the Berlin mission. Oh, they, they, their voice is so good. It's very, very, very good. So I think I'm about like roughly halfway through because I'm taking my time and I'm doing like when you finish level, I'm going back and replaying it for different story missions, different challenges and whatnot. So I'm pr probably playing like each level twice before moving on to the next story one. And that game is wildly good, eh? And th this is like your first proper taste of Hitman, isn't it? So I actually went back and I, I was I realized that I have played Hitman Absolution. Mm. No and one remembers that playing that game though. It's just yeah, a weird thing. from Mandela what effect. I remember, from what I remember, that game was weirdly like restrained. Like it kept you in corridors a lot of the time, and like it was fairly linear as well. I remember there were whole stealth segments which felt more like Splinter Cell because you were hiding in shadows and. Uh, there were a lot of like scripted AI movements. It wasn't so. I mean, I, my my first Hitman experience was oh, this is just Splinter Cell, but with a darker sense of humor, which isn't which isn't fair. I, I think the yeah, one takeaway I saw here from that game is this whole big you know uproar they had over the, the uh, advertising for it because it had you hunting down uh, nuns in latex outfits. Yes, I remember. People really got upset about that. Really? Yeah, there was a big uproar. Oh, that's wild. It was like sex, sexist marketing, that, that kind of idea, which I can get behind, but to me, it was just baffling that this was even included. I was like, okay, all right, you yeah, know, this is the way we, we did go. feel like a weird addition to that game, but... It was a weird swerve. Weird swerve, but I mean, okay, if, if I mean, let's be honest, it's not exactly doing anyone harm any time soon because no one exactly remembers Hitman Absolution. But yeah, I, I do believe that Absolution is kind of underrated because, you know, for all the bad ideas it had, it had some fantastic ideas. And you could really get a handle of how good Io was at crafting an, an actual sandbox level, even you know, even if it wasn't going in the right direction that fans wanted. That was that was published by Square Enix, wasn't it? Was it was it wasn't Ida's Montreal still in charge back then? We'll have to research it. But yeah, Hitman Three is very very good. There are a few complaints about it, but I'd rather talk about the things that I think it does very well um, before I get to my bitching session. <laughs> You know, what I do love is, um, look, if you've played any of the other previous two Hitmans that have been out since 2016, I mean, there's almost hardly anything different here. This has been a superb modular experience so far, but it goes out on such a subtle but a high note for me. I mean, Hitman 3, I think, is some of the absolute best level design in the entire franchise, front and center. Pulling pulling from which levels? Because out of the three I've played, the, the standout one, and I said this to you before we recorded earlier this week, is that the Dartmoor Mansion level is exceptional. Oh, dude, like, for, for, for me, the uh, high point of Aya's current world of assassination trilogy was the Sapienza level from the, the first Hitman. Oh, from the first one. I realized yeah. that I actually have that through the Epic Game Store. They gave it away free a few months back. Huh. I'm going to go back and play it when I'm done with Hitman 3. But with Hitman 3, like, it starts off uh, the Dubai level is Hitman as absolute classic paint by numbers excellence. You know, you've got this fantastically opulent place. You've got some rich people you've got to kill. It's, it works on multiple layers. And then from there, you transition to, to Dartmoor, which is just this amazing murder, reverse murder mystery level that you explore and there's just secrets everywhere there's also a time limit you know if you if you actually don't do anything at all well well actually if you do one certain action you you can pull off an assassination without having to do anything at all it's it's just so multi-layered it boggles my mind i was i can't remember who it was i think it was um mark brown on game makers toolkit or oh, it was writing on games i can't remember who it was. It was someone on youtube described hitman especially this current hitman as if you are playing one of the most intricate clockwork automate and machinery like design sort of levels because everything does work on a very minute and intricate system right everything is so particular and just beautifully interwoven into the actual like design and layout of the level the planning that you can set up and the just the random bullshit you can cause in each of those levels based on just a few small actions because of how connected everything is is mind-bogglingly like intense i can't imagine how long it takes io to design a lot of those encounters and i also think of the game as a reverse roguelike i mean because let's face it those targets those assassination victims that you're after they are absolutely easy to take care of but if you stuff up everyone in that level is going to come gunning for you and you'll be taken out in no time yeah you you told me to when i first started playing to just run with my mm. mistakes and i've 
I've I've been trying to do that to some extent, but I'm also finding it kind of difficult because the second I get spotted, I go down basically, which I don't know if I'm playing the game badly or whatnot. So often I'm not like forcing a reload onto myself. I'm dying, which I don't mind because I prefer doing things perfectly. Like I feel like those run with your mistakes are better for sort of second playthroughs when I'm not trying to do the story or those specific sort of goals, right? Yeah, because once you've got your, your, your first mission accomplishment, once you've got those guys killed the first time, no matter how difficult it may be, you're going to get some rewards in the process. You're going to get a new starting uh, point. You're going to get new mm. items that you can use in your inventory. And you need to have a look at your mission challenges as well, such as hold my hair. So, you know, poison the guy with emetic poison when he goes to have a drink of something, follow him to a toilet and drown him in his own vomit. And just, Jesus. you know, get extra points, follow those mission stories, observe, plan, and react. And that is where Hitman is at its best. You're just the this, this spanner waiting to be thrown into that intricate clockwork mechanism. And when you when you are thrown into those gears, all hell breaks loose if you want if you wanted to. But eventually you're gonna to get to a point where you can tackle a a run and you're gonna do it within five minutes, you're gonna kill these guys, and no one's going to know that you were even there. And that's just the beauty of Hitman. When you go from this funding killer on on the run in this gorgeous level to a point where you become the, the titular silent assassin of legend. So how does I haven't played the other the, the other Hitmans. How does Hitman three compare to the other two because if it's if the other two are anywhere near as good as three like i'm gonna go back and play them immediately as i'm finished this one uh, gameplay wise it is identical i mean this is this is like you know basically if i was making a fifa game this is what <laughs> you would expect this iterative update the only real uh upgrades i can see are some slight ui upgrades the inclusion of a camera to hack certain certain items within stages Otherwise, it's the exact same experience in Hitman's 1 and 2. And that's just beautiful because they've really been working on this gigantic modular world of assassination trilogy. And now that you look at the entire picture, you've got so much content mm. to explore. It's, God, it's, it's almost Because they've much. added Hitman 1 and 2. You can, like, launch Hitman 1 and 2 through 3, um, if I remember the men menus correctly. One of my... Which I suppose takes me to one of my gripes is that I think the menus of the game are kind of a mess maybe i'm just too used to it because i mean i've been playing this game since 2016 so yeah. it's had a pretty uniform menu system since then slight upgrades slight tweaks so i'm very used to it i know when, when i first opened up there were different <clears throat> there were different tabs and then there were different tabs within those those tabs and there was tiles within those tabs and I, it was really quite overwhelming it took it like me a second to be like oh, what the shit am i looking at i that i need to figure this out but I mean, other than that, I feel like what Hitman does better than a lot of other games is when you're actually in the level, its UI is so minimal, yet also not, it, it's present, right? But it's not mm -hmm. like overpowering you, like which I feel is something that happens a lot, ha has happened a lot in like modern games. If you look at um, like a Grand Theft Auto V, right? Everyone's going for like, that. that I feel like that kickstarted this whole minimal take on uh ui's in game and i love that hitman's is both very minimal it's very understated but it's never you, you you're never left wanting for information right it's a really well implemented um ui once you get out of those main menus it's like the antithesis of cyberpunk 2077 it's, it's just just exactly oh. the opposite of that because don't open that can of worms darren i could talk for another two <laughs> hours about cyberpunk but we're not here to talk about cyberpunk or may maybe a different example tom clancy's the division i haven't played the division are those uis also bad hey there is so much information that you have to process but it, it's in a way, it makes sense because it's a military shooter. So it's got layers upon layers of information mm. being fed through to you. You can play without it, but just as default mode, there's a lot to absorb right there. Hey, how long did you play The Division 2 for? Division 2? I think I got about 50 hours into oh, that's it. that's more than I was expecting, actually. Oh, yeah, I had, a, I had a good time. I mean, I had a few regular weekly uh, sessions with friends, you know. I just you know tried some of the, the missions on a harder difficulty mm. setting just to get some gear, which... <sighs> The thing is about that game, its gear system still makes absolutely no sense to me. So I just put on whatever's got high numbers and shiny pictures attached to it. Very fair. Talking about shiny, let's go back to Agent 47's head. Um, <laughs> or, or, or in particular, just I want to talk more about the narrative, the story of Hitman 3. 
which I mm. am assuming is going to make a lot more sense for you, being having played the other ones, because I came to through like what I who's gray. Ah, uh, okay. Who is what? What is what is what is going on? And it it, it was very, which isn't it isn't a knock against the actual game because it's more a knock against me for not playing the other two. I'm sure it would make a lot more sense, but like. For you, does the narrative hold up without going into spoilers? Well, obviously. what I will say is that I, I think when when the first Hitman episode came out, because IO Interactive was going for that episodic approach, they were purposely very vague, you know, very lean on story details. And then when Hitman 2 mm. came out, when they went for the full game approach, they had to focus more on story. Hitman 2 definitely had a meatier story, but it was still purposefully light on those details. But... In Hitman 3, the, the story, it finally takes front and center, not just between those cinematics that you see, but also, you know, in the interactions you have with people when you when you are exploring a sandbox stage and you're noticing chats and discussions between people. There's a lot of story that unfolds if you are observant. But, of course, there is a main plot line. And when that finally comes to the end of stage six, I have to say, it's a subtle but an explosive ending, and it left me extremely satisfied. Okay, that's good. From what I've from what I've seen, it's a fairly in-depth spy thriller, mm. which also makes them a very good fit, as I'm sure you've already said somewhere on the site, for a James Bond game, because there are multiple times throughout what I've played Hitman Three, I was like, wow, this is this is James Bond, like pulling out your camera to like scan the window to unlock it. That was just James Bond. I, I would Bond. actually say that the nearest cinematic equivalent of Hitman 3's storyline would be the recent Mission Impossible films that have come out. Fair. Actually, now that you bring it up, yeah, I it can see that. It has that down-to-earth, you know, back-to-basics appeal. Like, they saw something fantastical happening, but it doesn't feel out of the realm of what is actually possible. I, I must admit, I, I found myself enjoying the character of Agent 47, mm. which is... I didn't think was going to be the case because I've always seen him from an outside perspective as just a very dead character who's meant to, I mean, by by design, right? He's meant to be this uh, cold-blooded killing machine. So to have him be a Nathan Drake would be kind of weird. I absolutely love his foreshadowing before he kills someone. Oh, it's so good. In in the in the um, the murder mystery level, what's it? Burnwood Dartmoor. Estate? Dartmoor. Dartmoor. Burnwood is Diana's yeah. last name. Yes. <laughs> uh, at Dartmoor, when when the butler says to him, "This is this is a highly sensitive matter, uh, and I trust that you should not tell anyone when you depart." <laughs> at age forty, at age forty seven, responds with, "Don't worry, she'll be dead to me as soon as I leave." <laughs> oh, <laughs> so there, good. There's one part in the Mendoza level where you have to poison one of your target's uh, glasses of wine. Yeah. And like you, you actually, you know, assume the role of a waiter. You serve her this drink, and age of forty-seven, it's like, how would you like a drink? It's to die for. Ah, oh, it's so good. <laughs> but but it is so James Bond. <laughs> it's so James Bond. I love it. But even beyond that, there's there's really cool little moments. I haven't played it personally, but I saw it on Twitter that there is a um, I can't. Is there a level set in like Shanghai or China or something? Uh, it's the Chongqing level. That's actually what you're going to be playing next. Okay. So since you've done the the Berlin level. Yeah, I think it's either Berlin or um that. Yeah, one, the is... the order of levels is Dubai, Dartmoor, Berlin, Chongqing, Mendoza, and then the Carpathian Mountains. Okay. Okay. It's one. Of, it's it's either one of those two levels where. You can be standing outside as Agent Forty Seven with a, a, an umbrella, and you can overhear Chunking. a conversation. Yeah, is that that okay? Then it is that yeah. one, yeah. And you can hear a conversation that one of the NPCs is having over the phone, and she eventually puts the phone. You, you can tell that she's talking to to a lover or someone, someone she's going on a date with, and she puts the phone down. She says, she sort of just like says to no one, "I'm really con- so concerned that she's." growing and evolving and changing and i'm just not able to keep up with her and agent 47 sort of turns to her and says everyone changes that's a part of life and they have this whole conversation that with, with agent 47 is just reassuring her like just follow your heart she does she does i'm sure she does love you don't don't, don't overthink it it's just such a weird humanizing moment but it was so funny to watch him give really good relationship advice as well i mean we would have thought that this killer who has been all over the world has left a trail of bodies behind him would be the perfect expert on relationships it's it, it, it was such a fun little touch and i feel like it works for 47 because he does have kind of a, a dark sense of humor not that he's sort of pulling on it in that encounter 
but that dark sense of humor runs throughout the game. So having this really good relationship advice from this <laughs> thuggish killer. No, he's not thuggish. He's he, he's much more. He's much this more. This dude is strength. suave to the extreme. Yeah, yeah, he really is. And it was just a really, it was just a really cool little feature, and I'm really glad that they put it in. I want to see how much of that, like, there is still left in the game to discover because it's still fairly new. I'm sure a lot of other NPC interactions are going to come out over the next few weeks. That being said, how are you enjoy join the upsetter for the assassinations and the actual payoff when you kill these guys? It's oh, it's so good, it, it, and it, I think it is made all the more better by how long it often takes to pull off. Dartmoor, I think last night it took me about an hour and a half to eventually pull it off. But I was going around and doing multiple like story things. I did the private investigator, I did the photographer. Um, and then I eventually got into a position where I was able to offer. And that satisfying feeling of I took her out, no one saw me, I hid the body so no one was going to discover her. And I just strolled out the front gate. No one knew anything. And it does this beautiful thing with, with this presentation where like as you are in like leaving the level getting close to like the y button to end it like the music starts to like build like you're just getting away with this major crime of the century and you eventually sort of exit the level just the swell of like the the the, the music as if you ah oh, it's so good it's so good that music is so brilliantly and organically in integrated into hitman it really is like it's it comes up at moments when you when you want it to like it really punctuates like what you've done in in a stage and it wraps the bow on your exploits beautifully it's really well implemented especially when you cock up i absolutely love how that music kicks in uh, admittedly i haven't heard that music because <laughs> i usually just load the game is it good <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's basically when you get discovered and like all the security guards are coming after you then the music like kicks into that benny hill chase sequence does it, does it really you know, it's like okay time to get out of here <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. What a good touch. <laughs> but, you know, I've just been enjoying... I mean, I've got, like, s several save games of mine just where I've set myself in the perfect perfect infiltration mm. position so I could just start, you know, getting more challenges completed. And last night, I discovered that you can actually put... You can put a banana peel on the ground and yes, stuff it Yes, I did up. see that on Twitter. I had no idea you could do that. So I restarted the Dubai level and I put banana peels on the section where, where the two targets will try and escape with uh, parachutes if you trigger the emergency protocol it was just so funny watching these guys fall like basically off that building because of a banana That's so peel good. I and the, the, the brilliant thing is they couldn't even open their parachutes because i'd <laughs> sabotage them with a kitchen knife <laughs> like if, if that sequence had played out normally they would have just dived off that building straight to their death because when they open their parachute it would break it's just the amount of possibilities in that game it's it's staggering it is genuinely one of the I, I, I never understood oh. why everyone made such a big deal out of Hitman because for the longest time I thought it was just sort of your generic stealth game, right? But actually getting into it, I don't think there is a game quite like Hitman. Like it is so, I've said it so many times, but it is so intricate in how it pulls everything off. I can't imagine how long it takes those developers to actually put that stuff together. Uh, I mean, I don't even look at Hitman 3 as, as a third game. I'm looking at the entire package now. Hitman 1 through 3 over the last five years. And to me, it is just this perfectly polished stealth sandbox. Uh, there is no game that even comes close to what it has attempted and succeeded at yeah, doing. It really, it really is like next level. It's, it's, and polish as well. You're right in saying like it is so well polished. I've come across like no bugs, no glitches, no nothing. It just works. You know, it, it Todd, Todd Howard weeps. He wishes you could make a game like this. <laughs> oh, and it's, it's just amazing. This kind of sandbox... Just one of those sandboxes would be a full game on its own. But in each one, you get six sandboxes. They're huge, hey? Those levels are massive. It has been such a fantastic journey. And you know what's, what's absolutely hilarious to me is that back in 2016, when the first episode came out, we had no one on Critical Hit that could review it. Uh, all the other guys were unbusy. So Jeff came to me and says, dude, could you just have a look at this over the um, weekend? I know you don't like these games. Could you just, you know, just give it a quick review? Yes, the um, season pass. I was like, huh, I don't want to, Jeff. I really don't want to. <laughs> but I'll do it because you're a nice guy and we are buddies. So I will review this. And game. he paid your salary. Yeah, that too. Being paid was, was a very big incentive. But um, yes. like, fine, I'll take the, the yeah this game. I'll take this case. I'll review it. And, you know, it comes to me on Monday. He's like, so, Darren, how was the game? I was like, Dude, dude! <laughs> Surprise of the year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. From that point on, I was one hundred and ten percent invested. Mm, mm. 
I'm definitely going to go back and play the first t t uh, yeah, two. Two now. I don't know if I'm going to go back and play all the older ones, but at least the first two of this trilogy. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised to find that my Hitman 3 code on Xbox includes the Hitman 2 access pass. Yeah, so. I also found that as well. That was quite cool. So yeah, so if you buy Hitman 3 on, I don't know if this applies to PS5 as well, but if you do have it on, on Xbox Series X, just go check if you got that Hitman 2 access pass. It really adds a lot of value. I think it was the I think it was the deluxe edition that ah. we, that we got. So I think that might be what it is. I know if you buy it on Epic, you also get the season pass for the first game. So mm, okay. I don't know if that carries through to any other uh, yeah, platforms. Because I got my my code for for the Amrivia and the walkthroughs on Xbox, but I played the previous two games on PlayStation. So mm. I've got Hitman One and Two with all the content on PlayStation now, but I've got Hitman Three with Hitman Two on xbox so you oh. know i think i'm, I'm gonna go drop some cash on hitman one just so i can have a complete trilogy right yeah there. i think it so. is I'm, worth it i'm also thinking of maybe trying to get the cheapish copy of the first game for the xbox as well just so i have them all there right you're, yeah. you're right it is nice to have them all in a convenient little package right um, i'm definitely gonna go buy but online I'll, i mean i can also wait for a sale but i mean uh, i'm also happy to say okay yes 400 rand which i think is how much it costs on the xbox marketplace because the first game it still holds up beautifully yeah so talking we spoke a lot about hitman uh, i haven't played anything else this week but i see you've been playing super hot mind control delete yeah that's on xbox game pass at the moment um i play i dabbled a bit in the first super hot but i wanted something cathartic between hitman sessions which also mm. strangely cathartic but you know you want something different just to keep the uh, brain engaged and it's a, those... a roguelike am i correct in saying i don't know i mean i, I can describe it for you i mean for, for those of you who haven't played super hot which really, you've got no excuse at really all. Really should this have point. played it, yeah. Super hot is a game where time only moves when you move. Or in, in a way, time is moving, but it has been slowed to an infinitesimal crawl. Um, mm. You think of Judge Dredd, that entire game is running on that slow mode drug from from Dredd. Yeah, I don't. I mean, don't ask me for the name of it, but I know the one you're talking about. No, no, it's called slow mo. That drug. Oh, is, is it called, called slow mo? Slow -mo. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But a bit yeah, on the so... nose there, Dredd, but okay. <laughs> But yeah, so it's a first-person game. You normally start without any weapons whatsoever, and you've got to work your way through a stage, take out a few dudes, and then you move on to the next one. But the, the um, challenge is, is that when you move, the um, rest of the stage moves. And if you try and play this game at a normal clip, you're going to die very quickly. Mm. So you've got to stop. You've got to pause. You've got to take a notice of your surroundings, what's happening around you. And that allows you to, to dodge guys who are coming at you with baseball bats. That allows you to dodge anyone that's shooting a bullet at you. That allows you to line up a perfect shot. So it's this intense puzzle game in a first-person shooter setup. And once you get through each stage, it is just fascinating and satisfying to see all your actions play out in real time. It reminds me a little bit of... Um... Or rather, when it came out, John Wick Hex reminded me a little bit of Super Hot, mm. in that it had that sort of take, take your time, look at your environment, look at your enemies, and then have everything play out, you know, in real time, as you said. Except I just think Super Hot does it cleaner. Oh yeah, it's it's got a very minimal de design approach mm. to it. And it's a, it's a good looking Hot's... game, hey? Yeah, it's because it's mostly like shades of grey white and red enemies like it really pops it mm. really leaves an impression mm. on you so what is wait so what is mind control delete it's not a sequel it's as far as i know it's sort of like a, a standalone expansion kind of deal yeah so the thing is with the first super hot game it had this really weird story running through it but mind control the delete it's basically saying uh, we're gonna you know not worry about the story too much yeah it's just a ton of gameplay plus we're actually going to add a few bonuses for you. You can Ooh. start a stage with a sword if you want. You can start a, a stage with a random gun equipped. You get this cool new dash punch ability. You get more hearts to your meter. Oh yeah, by the way, if you take one blow, you are dead. So, you know, having Good. the ability to, to take two or three blows is pretty helpful stuff. Yeah, it's pretty useful. I was under the impression that it was sort of this infinite, potentially like non-stop thing where you had to survive as long as you possibly could. I don't know where I'm getting that from. I might have dreamed that. I, I don't know if there's some sort of horde mode attached to it because I've, I've only played it for a few hours. I've only gone through, I think, two or three of its sections. 
because it can be proper challenging from time to time. But it's it's, it's a worthwhile game. Absolutely, uh, it's, it's it's on Xbox Game Pass at the moment. So if you have a s- subscription, you know, just grab it. It's a tiny download. It's a handful of gig- gig- gigabytes. So you know what? You've got nothing to really lose. It's you might find yourself drawn in. You might find yourself sucked in. It's. Ha- how... Makes me wish I had a VR headset. Oh, I was going I was literally just about to bring it up. I at at the my office we have a Oculus Quest with super hot VR loaded onto uh. it. So wildly cool. One of the coolest gaming experiences I've ever sat through. It is amazing. I want I want a VR headset so badly for um, two reasons. Uh, first reason is obviously to, to play games, which you know of course. must be wild in that format. Yep. And second reason, you know, just for some some fitness, I want to get Beat Saber. Just, you know, stay in my room, flailing my arms around. It's Beat Saber's, yeah, that was the other game, actually, incidentally, we have on that Oculus Quest. It's it's so good. So, so cool. And you get really sweaty as well, which isn't great for the Oculus, like, headset, because it starts (laughs) soaking up your sweat. And you don't particularly want to share it around, because then everyone else in the office is very aware of, wow, you really sweat a lot. Are you okay? You drinking enough water? No, no, I'm drinking enough water. I promise you, I'm actually okay. Okay, but I don't want to put this on my head now, because it's all coated in sweat. It's it's not a fun experience. Which uh, which Oculus is it that, that you don't need to have attached to a computer? Uh, it's the Quest. It's the Quest and the Quest 2. So, so how does that work? Does, do you just like insert a, an SD card with games on it inside? Yeah, it's got, a little, it's got a little... Um, I don't even think it's an SD card. I think it just has storage into it. I don't know if it's SD card expandable. Hmm. But it, it, because the pricing on it's not too bad. Yeah, it depends how much cash you're flying around, I suppose. <laughs> the, only, the only thing with the Oculus Quest is while it's not attached to a computer, it is attached to Facebook, which sucks. Oh, screw it. I don't care. I hardly use Facebook. The only thing I do on Facebook is browse toy forums. Yeah, I, I use it for the marketplace every once in a while because oftentimes you can get some really good like secondhand furniture on Facebook Marketplace because people just dump whatever they want to there. It's much easier. Or country. you can sell something on the marketplace and you just get these fantastic offers of someone wanting to give you the old Samsung phone. Oh, Darren, I, I really wish we had we had time to go into your Facebook marketplace exploits because they are <laughs> so good. They are so good. <laughs> I, I, I think I've got to tell you one quick story about that. It's so funny. Please do. Um, I was looking for Transformers toys on the marketplace. I saw someone was selling a cheap uh, Chinese knockoff Transformer for 2,000 rand. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, it wasn't even in his box. It, was, it had some Cash Crusaders label on it. So I sent this guy a message. I said, hi, is this still available? The guy's like, yes, it's still available. Do you want it? I was like, no, I just wanted to see if anyone was stupid enough to, to pay Oof. for it. <laughs> this guy let me have it. <laughs> really? Hey, did he go in on you? <laughs> oh, he was so upset. I was saying, but then at the end of that discussion, I was like, yeah, but you know what? You've got a useless toy and I've still got 2,000 Rand in my bank account. So who's, who's, the, who's the loser here? Who's the loser there? I wonder, if, I wonder if he genuinely thought it was worth something or if he was just straight up trying to con people. Who knows? I don't think people really have an understanding of what items are, are valuable these yeah. days. I mean, if you go to an, an antique shop, it is the biggest load of crap inside there. Yeah, no, it's just it's just garbage. Mm. I, I want to continue this thread, but I actually haven't been in enough antique no. shops. For, uh, <laughs> in recent days, I'll be honest with you, I haven't been <laughs> antiquing all that much considering <laughs> the state of the world. <laughs> quick, 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 find a, find a good segue. A, a good segue. Um, you, you know, Oh, you know what is sort of antique-like because it's old, <laughs> styled? <laughs> It's WandaVision. Oh, WandaVision. I want, to move, I want to move on to what we've been watching because I have now consumed three episodes of WandaVision and have absolutely adored every second of it. Really? I, I've absorbed one entire episode. I was like, you know what? I'm going to skip the, the rest of this until the uh, shit hits the fan. That's fair. That is fair. But from what, from what I... From speaking about it in the critical hit offices, from what I understand... You don't like it all that much. No, no, I do not. I get what WandaVision is trying to undo. This whole idea with each episode being set in a sitcom from a different decade. That is admirable. That is something very fascinating. But do you have to devote an entire episode to each sitcom? Because sitcoms are you know, sitcoms are trash. I cannot stand it. That laugh track makes my, my blood curdle. Yeah, but I... I I, that that is the point though right like I, I i i get what you're saying that that is definitely that point to punctuate the normality the cleanness of a sitcom with the weird darker elements of what that show is going to be building to but it's hardly there so the first two episodes do take a while there's some weird stuff that happens the third episode which came out i watched it last night 
that's like i feel like from this point on from third episode on stuff's going to get progressively more in your face it's going to start making it's going to be more hints given to what is actually going on and what is causing this whole sitcom situation i mean i feel like you and i know basically what it is but mm. we we can't really die i don't want to spoil I think, that i think because i know what's, what's coming i don't have the impatience to sit through all that setup i, I just don't. fair fair for me I, for me i i don't really mind sitting through the whole thing because i think that what they've done in replicating those sitcoms from the 50s 60s and 70s was the latest one it's remarkable hey they they go all in on a thoroughly accurate representation of those very iconic shows right the practical of the, the, there there is a shot in the first episode where they're talking about um wedding rings and they they without going into too much detail they they don't have them so you know wanda says well let's just change that and there's a there's like an over the shoulder shot of their hands and to like represent the magic that she's creating causing it just like hard cuts into like the same shot except they have rings on their fingers and they don't try and hide it they go all in on how like goofy and bad <laughs> it looks like it's just a solid commitment that's what i like about wandavision it's is its commitment to doing those shows really well mm. and the, the acting i will say is top notch uh what's her name elizabeth, elizabeth olsen? olsen yeah yeah she is so underrated as an actress and then you got paul bettany who has some of the best comic timing that you hardly ever get to see in, in films he's or so TV. excellent he is i feel I, I and i'm so glad that he's getting such a predominant role in wandavision because i've always said he was wasted in the mcu up until now oh my uh well i did that article on uh, <coughs> a knight's tale a couple of weeks ago yeah. like i watched yeah. the entire film with the director's commentary on and the um the director of that film brian helgeland he had bettany with him you know just to, to chirp him along with me away and that scene where, where paul bettany first appears in a knight's tale you know you see him from behind he's completely naked and paul bettany's like ah yes where my buttocks were introduced to america and they're my face. <laughs> oh, poor bit. I'm really, really pleased that he's that he's getting some well deserved prime screen time because he he's been denied for too long. But yes, One Division. We'll talk about that more. I feel when you've either that, caught up or said, finished it. Yeah. That being said, I am so excited for when Falcon and the Winter oh Soldier comes out. Oh my god, I'm so excited for that. Because the um, whole thing, they haven't really given it th that much of, of a detailed trailer, but I think from what I've seen so far, they're going to have the Captain America re replacement, John John Walker, mm. take a major role in that story. And if you know what happens in the comics with John Walker, <gasps> it's going to be such a such a timely commentary on America yeah. as a whole. I think when he arrives, it's. it's which is why I have to imagine they're going to go that route, right? Mm, I think hate manga has been rumored to appear. I, I don't know. I, I've been trying to keep myself away from all trailers and spoilers and whatnot. Oh. So I'm, I, because Captain America is my boy. I love Captain America. And yeah. I know he's not going to be in it, right? But oh, I just, no, that, man. that, those particular movies with Falcon and Winter Soldier and like the stories and characters around them from going back all the way to the 60s. I just, 60s, 70s, I just adore them. So I'm going in completely blind. I really do hope Hate Monger is in it though, because that would make a lot of sense. I mean, I don't know how they're going to handle that character because if I remember correctly, Hate Monger in the the comics was a clone of Hitler. Yes, he was, and I d I doubt they're going to go that. Look, that was always fairly dumb, right? But it's it, it, <laughs> yeah. it's comic books. You can get away with it. I comic books. Comic books. You can get away with doing dumb shit all the time. I have to imagine if they do a Hate Monger, it's going to be more grounded in realism mm. i know baron zima is also going to be in this one you know one of the, the actual few marvel villains who's not dead yeah which is we can okay quick tangent let's go uh the, the worst thing about the mcu is that it has such a stupid tendency to kill off its villains why you know what what i hate is that for, for whenever they have a new film starring a new superhero the villain is always i'm like you but evil. but bad my power set is exactly <laughs> yours except i'm just slightly stronger and you won't be able to beat me with force why why did they do... i don't why know it's, doing so, that? it's so so lazy I, I i have to i have to hope that going forward like future films don't do that yeah it's the you know, things you could count on in life is life death taxes 
a Marvel hero having a villain who's slightly just like them, but evil, and a wormhole in the sky. Yep, exactly. Always a wormhole in the sky. I just, I don't <laughs> want them to kill off every single villain. I can think of Vulture didn't die. Mysterio you didn't die. You don't kill die. Batman. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. Um, no, Mysterio did die. No, did no Mysterio, Mysterio comes back in the... Oh, wait, no, wait. You're right. I don't, I don't want to get... In. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Skip ahead like yeah. 10 seconds. The post credit scene is Mysterio um, talking to the world through one of the um, screens in New York. But look, if, if they can rewrite any death, they can do it with Mysterio, and I will not complain about it. Very, that. very, very fair. I just... Like, it would be so cool to see, like, Ironmonger go up against uh, Spider-Man or whoever. Just have, like, different villains from, from different heroes' movies show up in other heroes movies right instead of just having to create an entirely new one and then just kill them off right being able to reuse that that makes it feel even more of an interconnected universe look there's no shortage of villains available so at least they've got a wide pool they can pull from and not you know maybe they can think okay maybe we shouldn't kill this dude for once um i've also been watching i don't really know how much i want to talk about it is a uh, night stalker i don't know how big you are into what is it tell me i've, I've heard of it but i have no idea what uh, it is at the risk of making the show a little bit too dark and filled with bummers <laughs> uh night stalker is based well it's a sort of documentary true crime documentary on a mm. man whose name i've forgotten who in the 80s was one of the is known as one of the most difficult serial killers to ever track down because he had absolutely zero modus operandi and would just go into different houses and murder anyone huh. with like very little connection between the cases and without going into the gruesome details of it it is a dark and fairly disturbing show is it's very good though is it like a full-on documentary or anything like fictionalized elements inside of it or no no it's it's full-on documentary it's it it's more like one of those high budget crime investigation channel Oh, uh, okay. So it's like like the, the shows. It's like they were a happy family until and the, <laughs> the image gets inverted. It's a bit yeah. The image, the image is inverted. It's a bit more tactful than that. They have they you know they talk to the detectives uh, if you track them on. They put a lot of focus on the detectives and how they um, they eventually caught the guy, which I I prefer that. I kind of don't like it when they bring in like victims' families because it always just feels yeah. a little bit sleazy. Like, hey, mm. we know that one of your loved ones died, but... Tell us making... about any extreme detail. Please, we're making money off this. You probably <laughs> won't see any of Cry it. for the camera. <laughs> yeah, I always feel a bit skeevy about that. But, like, <laughs> actually listening to, like, the detectives talk about the process and how they you know, eventually catch the guy was very, very interesting. Yeah, uh, so... It's a bit overproduced at times. It's kind of trying to be very artistic when it need not be because mm. it's probably trying to distance itself from those crime channel kind of do documentaries. Uh, okay. But if you have any, if you have any interest in, in true crime and serial killers, um, yeah, it's a pretty good show, pretty good watch. You know what, just a quick tangent on that. One thing I really enjoyed watching was this thing about India's corrupt billionaires. It's mm -hmm. so weird how the richer some people get, the closer they are to believing that they are God. It is weird, right? That that, that connection we have with money, right? Yeah. It's like the, the more money you have, the literally above society you become. Yeah. And these dudes literally start cults of personality. It, yeah. It's like it happens every single time. I'll, I had this on in the background while I, was, while I was building a Gundam kit. I was like, huh, huh, huh. It's like, oh, huh. I should be rich so I could get away with this stuff. Of yeah, course. Cool. I mean, listen, we start we started a video game website. That's the closest to a modern day cult you can probably get. Yeah, I'll be like, one day I'll do a public appearance and I'll be like, bow down to your new god, peasants. <laughs> We give you we give you the news and the reviews. What more could you want? What more Be could you ask? Be grateful, trolls. <laughs> Be grateful. Are you grateful for Disenchantment season three? Oh, jeez. Okay. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Disenchantment, it is from the creator of The Simpsons and a large chunk of the creative team behind Futurama. Mm. And I think we can both agree that a large, well, the um, first early chunks of the The Simpsons, let's say that the first ten seasons. Absolutely Season, brilliant. I I, I want to go out, I want to go out and, and, and die on the hill yeah because um I I would consider myself to be a little bit of a Simpsons not mega fan but a pretty massive fan. I've got seasons one through fifteen on like box set DVD like I fifteen had one of my favorite episodes the one where Lisa gets elected to be school president. Yes, it's so good. <laughs> Especially with groundskeeper Willie. Oh man, it's it's excellent. It's so so good. 
Um, but I, my, The Simpsons gets bad after season 12, and that's the hell I die on. Okay, that, that's fine. You know what? I can accept that. There were still a few gems here and there, but yeah. the current Simpsons product is something I don't even bother with. I haven't bothered yeah. with it for the last five or six years, I think. No, I don't care for it either. So after, but, after about season 12, it's there. Yeah. But I think we can both agree that Futurama is an absolute masterpiece. It's... Yeah, there, 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 is, there are very few animated comedies that get to the level of Futurama. So we've had basically an animated sitcom set in, con- set in contemporary times. We've had Futurama, which is set a thousand years in the future. So we've got Disenchantment, which is set in a fantasy medieval land. What could possibly go wrong, right? Uh, I, can, can I answer that question? Yes. They can make it boring. Yes, and there, there we go. You've hit the nail on the head. The um, thing is with this enchantment is it is brilliantly animated. I mean, it's, honestly, it's got some of my favorite art styles. I love the voices. I love the mm. emotional impact that the story has. But the, the main stumbling block for me is that the um, core humor, it falls so flat and it drags those great characters down with it. Yeah, it's just that I've watched one season of it and I, was, and I consistently watched the first season of it because I was like, I'm going to enjoy this. And then I got about like three episodes and I was like, I really want to enjoy this. And you're about halfway through, I'm not going to enjoy this. But then I just kept watching because I was so adamant that I still (laughs) wanted to enjoy it, but I just never did. Let me love you, damn it. (laughs) Just be better. Be better. That's all I ask of you in Disenchantment is to be better. Yeah. So if you haven't seen it, basically the the entire setup of the um, show is it's fantasy land Futurama. You've got a core trio of characters, Princess Tia Beanie, or just Bean for short, uh, her own literal personal demon that's been summoned from hell, Lucy, and Alpha, who is the freaking worst character ever, you know, yep. in all of animation. He is the Eric Sparrow of animation. Yo, that's a bold if, take. Yeah, so if you play Tony Hawk's Underground, you, you know what I'm talking about, how annoying he is. Mm-hmm. You, you know, Alpha kind of makes me think, you know when you get like those super aggro dudes who are like, oh, you're a beta cook. That, that's, that is <laughs> what they're talking about. That is Alpha right there. Every yeah. negative stereotype about you know, a simple whatever is, yeah. is Alpha. <laughs> yeah, that 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 that's fair. I don't know. There's just there's something about that show that just never that just never it never hit for me. It never felt like it was cohesive. It always felt like a bunch of ideas that they sort of thrown together on the screen. They were like, we want to do a fantasy and cool. We want to have our people take our character seriously. Rad. We can do that. We also want it to be funny. And uh, cool. We can do that as well. It needs to look like The Simpsons, but not like The Simpsons. Okay, okay we can. I guess we can do that too. It, no, no part. It feels like a bunch, like a buckshot of ideas, mm. and only a few actually hit. The I, I do, I do like one of the few ideas that, that does work, as you mentioned, is having Matt Berry voice a prince who gets turned into a pig, who just embraces his curse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, listen, Matt Berry can be put in anything and he's the best part of it. Yeah, I mean, you don't even need the rest of the, of the um, cast. Just have a show about Matt Berry as a pig. Yeah, that's literally all you need. Matt Berry as a pig who also is a vampire. And now you've you've created the, the best show, the best combination of shows you could possibly hope to find in the world. But, you know, that, that, that humor in that show, it's, it's such boomer humor. It's just like... Eh, it okay. is, hey. It's, it's the most laugh, laughter you, you'll have. It's like, just a... <laughs> that's yeah. it. Yeah. How old is Matt Groening now? That dude must be, I don't know, must be 60 spot by now. He's been around for a while. I mean, he's great, so that's a good sign. So, well, so he, he I, I don't know if he's a boomer, but like I can, I mean, The Simpsons was very much a riff on that kind of sort of sitcom, right? Yeah, I mean, Simpsons started in 1988 or 1989 on the Tracy Ullman Tracy show. Tracy Ullman a series, show, yeah. It's a series of shorts, if I have that right. Yeah, you're right. So Tracy it was, v- it was v- very much a 90s show at its peak. And, you know, we're in the freaking 20s of a new millennium now, so you do the maths. Yeah, and it still feels like he's kind of just telling the same jokes over and over again. I know. It's like he's trying to recapture the magic of Futurama, but it's just not working. The problem with Futurama is that Futurama was too clever for its own good. Ah, uh, you got that right. Because there, there is an amazing video essay. Um, the YouTuber's name is Captain Christian, if anyone wants to look it up. He does a, an essay on... Um, Futurama and what I didn't know and it blew my mind when I found out is that the writer's room of Futurama was known by like the production team as the most overqualified team of writers of in in history I think I think something like in in the writer's room of Futurama there was something like three PhDs in like quantum science chemistry and biology and stuff like that like eight master's degrees and 12 
undergrads all in like maths and science like none of them actually studied <laughs> literature or, or writing <laughs> they all studied maths and, and science and stuff and that's uh, reflected in the show, right? Which is just I mean, so I mean, cool. the, the uh, other writers from other TV shows walk past every room and they were just like, nerds! Nerds! <laughs> what are you doing? Are you working in your nerd show? Nerds? Yeah. Look at this. Someone's writing a comedy setup about Schrodinger's cat. Look at this uh -huh. nerd. <laughs> we're we're going to pay the Big Bang Theory cost way more than you'll ever earn. Ooh, ooh, that's a low blow. Yeah, listen, I don't don't get me started. I'm gonna get I'm I'm gonna get progressively angry if this continues <laughs> down a big bang theory path. But yeah, I, what, what I will say about this enchantment is that it's hardly funny. It's beautifully animated, and it is just so incredibly frustrating. That it's got long form storytelling and plan, but it is so stupidly vague about what it wants to say. Yeah, is season three better than season one and two? Yeah, I, there's nothing memorable about it, so you know I can't really say uh name okay well maybe season four because i doubt it's getting cancelled because no 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 fourth time will not be the charm for me yeah probably not hey i see you did that that was fun <laughs> so you want to move on to some news yeah let's talk about the gaming news let's talk about let's talk about the news i feel like the biggest news of the week came on thursday and it was for resident evil village yes we finally have confirmation that resident evil village the eighth core game in the series will be out on last gen and current gen and PC on May 7th. And it has a big tall lady. Oh, I love big tall vampire lady big, so much. Big tall vampire lady is my dreams. She's what I see when I close my eyes oh. and not in a horrifying way. Yeah, I just want her to hold to hold me and keep me safe. Yeah, I just want I just want I just I don't even want her to love me. I just want her to sort of like respect me. And I feel, I feel like and that's the a, internet loves her. Yeah, internet has gone wild for crazy tall vampire lady. So she, which she actually appears in the demo, by the way. There's a free PS5 demo um, that's currently available, uh, which mm. I played through yesterday, uh, and it's short. It's like twenty minutes, thirty, if you really want to take your time and take it all in. There's no combat. It's more just sort of setting the tone. She does. She does. If, if you want, if you want to get your first like in action glance of uh tall vampire lady um, she's in the end of that demo spoilers oh well you know what's, what's been you know pretty obvious is that like, the internet adores tall lady the internet loves her and then of course you get that gross side of the internet that's like oh step yeah, on me tall vampire there's, lady step there's, on me there's, there's, there's <laughs> always going to be that one at corner of the internet that sort of takes a meme like that and runs the, in the direction that no one really wants to go in yeah look i don't want to kink shame anyone but being stepped on is one of the weirdest fetishes it, I've it, ever it, it is it is weird and i i wouldn't i don't want to be stepped on i don't know about you i don't like when someone steps on my toes i don't want to be i don't want someone <laughs> to step on my body that's that's a, that's that's a bridge too far if you ask me you know look i, I don't know if, if i'll enjoy it until i've tried it but hey if that if that's what floats your boat <laughs> You know, well, they're all good to you. At least this character's fictional. I, that might make it worse, Darren. I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, <laughs> there is a lot to talk about for Resident Evil. So if anyone wants to, like the, 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 the breakdown, the, the nitty gritty, it is up on the Critical Hit website. But it looks fantastic. It looks like it's going to be a proper continuation of the good stuff they did in Resident Evil 7 and keeping the first person perspective. It almost looks like they're taking resident evil 7 or resident evil 4 and sort of mashing them into one idea Ooh. because they've they're, they're bringing back and i fairly sure it, like the, like the inventory system is very very resident evil 4 the way you can like chop and change and and and, and rotate items to better fit into your little i don't know if, i guess it's a briefcase layout they've mm. also they're also bringing back the merchant where you can purchase gear and um, ammo and health and whatnot Up i have to imagine there'll be upgrades i don't know which is also a, very, a, a resident evil 4 edition as someone who's played you know a lot of resident evil would you say that you know th this game having a first person perspective does that make things scarier for you so playing resident evil 7 in the first person perspective initially it's kind of jarring because it doesn't feel like a resident evil game but when you realize what they're going for and they're going for that claustrophobic derelict mansion sort of surrounding it makes a lot of sense why they would switch it to first person because a lot of those corridors are so narrow and confined and there's just so much junk and clutter everywhere that i think having it as a third person perspective i don't think it would have looked good 
if that makes sense. Like Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3, those sort of behind the back cameras were, or over the shoulder camera works because while those spaces are fairly isolated and claustrophobic in their own right, there's a lot more space to exist in and move around in. But Resident Evil 7, it's really confined. Like it's it's boxed in and it's closed off. And that being able to see your entire character fit into that, I think it sort of removes from the atmosphere. I think first person is a great move for them. I think it works really well. Huh, so it really drives home that, that impact. I think that's, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, I think it really goes a long way to creating that the atmosphere that Resident Evil 7 did really well. I don't think Resident Evil 7 would be anywhere near as scary if you were in third person. Not even uh, slightly. One day I will be brave enough to play a modern Resident Evil game. I feel like I feel like you should try get in on some of the I feel like try play Resident Evil remake or 2 remake. That's, that's I don't think that's necessarily scary. It's Here's the thing. I don't think Resident Evil's scary. I think it goes for like a lot of gross out horror. Like there's a lot of weird body transformations. That's what scares me. I I have such a phobia against body horror for for some reason. Like if I see a film is directed by David Cronenberg, I am hightailing it out of that cinema. Are you not a body? Oh, okay. Fair enough. Body horror freaks me out, man. Okay, well then, yeah, Resident Evil. (laughs) Maybe don't play Resident Evil then because that's literally all the games. (laughs) I mean... What was that other thing? You know, that they filmed The Thing is one of the biggest horror films to me of all time. Oh, I love The Thing. It's one of the best movies But I absolutely adore the actual production values of how they created these monsters. So it's like, yeah. it's something I love looking at, but also I hate looking at it. Because I'm like, oh, it's, this it's thing is so vile. awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the word. It's like beautifully vile. Yeah, I, 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 I The Thing is one of my favorite movies ever. And Resident Evil, especially the remakes, capture a lot of what that does really, really well. But Resident Evil 8 looks like it's continuing along that trend. There's the tra- the traders were dropped, and it looks uh, firstly like visually it look it looks gorgeous. Like I want to really see what this thing looks like on a next gen console. It looks great, and the demo looks great on a PS5. Not mind blowing. Looks good though. Mm, and I saw to see how Chris Redfield achieved Super Saiyan second grade form. Oh, he's he's got a, he's got a very good coat this time. I I actually I actually googled up the Super Saiyan forms, and I am just astonished at how many different Super Saiyan forms have been added to the Dragon Ball mythos over the last couple of years. Darren, you can't make every conversation about Dragon Ball Z. I can try, damn it. We've had we've spoken about this. Oh, you will this. not stop me. You can't you can't just come in here and, and swing your Dragon Ball Z stick around and, and hit everything. It's Al- that's just not it's just not gonna work. Alessandro will hear of this mark my words. Alessandro hears this he can t- report directly to me. <laughs> and, and, and we'll and we'll have words but um sticking with, with resident evil 8 uh if you get the the game you're also getting a little bit of a freebie which is resident evil reverse a mm. character shooter a multiplayer shooter yeah it looks which, pretty neat as well uh, yeah i mean i don't think anyone was asking for it because there was a resident evil multiplayer shooter a couple of years ago was it umbrella core i think it was it that um was, it was, was it was mercenaries on yeah yes yes that game was kind of dreadful, so you know mm. it's a tainted. Oh, chalice. listen, there was a there was a there was a multiplayer mode for Resident Evil Three remake. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, uh, yeah, most of us did. <laughs> uh, it it was fine. Like I just don't understand why Capcom is so obsessed with making Resident Evil multiplayer work. They clearly don't. They, their games are selling fine. They clearly don't need it. Mm. You know. Yeah, but it, it's maybe it's just a, a a relic from the past. You know, from from the Capcom days, but. Uh, Whatever. I, I, I saw on Twitter that someone, and this is just speculation based on who I follow, it looks like for Reverse, they have, to get everyone to fit into the same area for like a multiplayer shooter setting and keep the movement as uh, open and fluid as possible, they've shrunk the character models. <laughs> And I don't know if it's true or not, but I really hope it is true because I really like the idea of a sort of like Lego-sized Resident Evil <laughs> multiplayer that really floats my boat in a way I did not expect it to, but I really hope it's true. You know, it's basically the, the, this entire Resident Evil package. It's appealing to all kinds of people. You like Tall Lady? Yes, Resident Evil 8. You like Small Lady? Yes, Resident Evil Reverse. <laughs> They really are like going in. They're cornering the market better than any other game at the moment. Um, so yes, what else can we talk about for news? I saw you wrote an article about Naughty Dog and the Punisher. Yes, there is. Well, oh, it's not a rumor or anything. Uh, Neil Druckmann, the the big cheese behind Naughty Dog, 
He was asked by Kind of Funny's Greg Miller what his dream IPs would be to work on. And the top of his list was The Punisher, which I think would be an absolutely amazing combination for him. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's... I mean, because, I mean, I haven't played Last of Us Part 2, but just talking to, to you, I, I understand how, how morally grey it is. I think that is mm. a perfect setup for the, the Punisher, who is not a hero. I mean, God, there's been so much controversy around this guy. But j just the idea of Naughty Dog handling a character who is solely driven by the destructive cycle of re re revenge. Yeah. I mean, I would play the heck out of that. I mean, yeah, they already made that game. It's called The Last of Us Part 2. <laughs> And uh, I gotta say, I'm, I'm really chuffed with how I, I managed to put a Punisher skull on Nathan Drake in the header image. It looks good, article. eh? I was just looking at it now on the side. It looks really, really good. Weirdly yeah. enough, it suits him. It does. Eh? I mean, if I just if I just photoshopped his hair a little bit more blacker, put some more yeah. blood on him, I think it would, you would have thought that was a Punisher video game right there. I mean, it makes sense considering the like thousands of people he slaughters throughout four games, but. Nah. <laughs> He's just, but, he's just Nathan Drake. He's just God. joshing around, you know. There was such a good Punisher game in 2004 on the PS2, if I remember correctly, which was basically like a prototype for modern-day Hitman with the way you could brutally kill people. I recently actually replayed that. There's a, I'm not going to detail oh. how I got my hands on it, but I did. And that game surprisingly holds up fairly well, huh? Oh, man. Doesn't that game still have a drunk Iron Man in it or something? I, from what I remember, it does have Tony Stark engaging in some of his more negative traits which yeah i know, kind I know of, he shows up i don't yeah. know if he was drunk in the armor already no no i don't think he was in the armor i think someone mentions tony stark and, and he is very clearly three sheets to the wind <laughs> and, and it's and it's it's quite a funny little moment because like oh you guys totally did get the whole point of iron man's arc in the 70s and 80s huh yeah you know, the thing is um yeah the, the, that game takes a lot of influence from goth ennis and steve the, 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 the guys that wrote the uh, mm. preacher and mm. they obviously did a really good run on the uh, punisher which included characters like <laughs> the, the uh, russian hello big boy <laughs> oh man it was so good. Anyway, punisher max punisher max it, I've, got, I've got a few of them here no that, that's that came much later this was early oh, was that 2000s. much oh are we talking about the earlier ones yeah oh, this okay. came early 2000s and ah. you know goth ennis freaking hates superheroes so whenever he gets a chance he takes the out of them. Yeah, no, he's fantastic. I mean, that's why that's the whole point of the boys, I suppose. I, I love that in one of the comics, the Punisher basically uses Spider-Man as a protective punching bag against the Russian. It's, dude, it's so it's so wildly good. I and I adore the Punisher. I I've always liked the idea of everyone in the Marvel universe is scared shitless of the Punisher, and he's just a dude. Hmm. He's not like this overpowered like god galaxy trotting planet eater. He's just a dude. And I feel like everyone is terrified of the Punisher. He, I, an, I love that. He is an absolutely fascinating character. But, you know, I would love to see a Punisher comic book series where he's more of a boogeyman in the shadows than anything else. Like, if you're a criminal, this is like the um, myth. He's basically the um, John Wick that's going to come and get you. They need to take a John Wick approach with the Punisher, I think. So, so it's actually so funny you, you, you say this. This is an, an idea I've had for uh, a, a, a story or a screenplay I've wanted to write for ages now. TM, 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 by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm mailing this to myself afterwards because I'm going to realize I'm putting it out there. Because I've always wanted to, like, pitch a story to Marvel in that it's an 80s slasher movie, except the villain is the Punisher. <gasps> I would read that. And you're following... Oh, my God, can you imagine? And you're following, like, a group of mafia thugs, whatever, hiding in a cabin in the woods to, like, lay low after some operation. And the Punisher, like, is systematically picking them off one at a time like and you never really all you ever really see of him is like the skull you never see his face because he is the horror monster in the back who is always just watching from the shadows dude i, I had such a similar idea with, with batman you know i like like a while ago i wrote this idea that i'm like these these criminals have just pulled off this heist they're hiding in this mansion and there's just batman in the shadows so you never see him though but if, if you do see uh, aspects of him it's drawn in a monstrous way like closer to the yeah. man bat or whatever it's just picking off these criminals one by one it's basically the um, raid as a horror film with batman uh, that was my, yeah, my pitch that sounds rad i feel like we need i mean do, i don't know if we really need more like dark and gritty heroes but like take the ones that already are kind of that to do weird shit with them that's yeah, cool exactly just take an established hero and just do a hard swerve to to the left yeah do a TM, series TM, of stories if, I swear to God, if I find the story being pitched to Netflix at some point in the future, I'm going to be incensed. Yeah, you heard it here first on Critcast, guys. We are watching you. Don't you dare steal our, our ideas. You.
We're watching you. We're just we're just here talking and sharing and and really opening ourselves up, you know, and and being vulnerable. And don't you dare steal our ideas. Or at least pay us for them. At the very least, pay us for them. Yeah, I I, I can do it with fortune and no fame. I could happily die that way. Yeah, I don't I don't mind that either. Talking about fortune and fame, Apex Legends has added a new hero. Ooh, nice segue. Thank you. By the name of Fuse, he's he's an Australian man. He's got a lot of <laughs> a lot of a lot of bombs, a lot of explosives. Good day, mate. Good day, mate. That yeah, there you go. He, he said it. That's exactly what Fuse says. And he comes into the arena and he starts throwing grenades and bombs. Is that it? Yeah, I don't. As I someone don't who doesn't really, play a lot of Apex Chelsea. Legends, I have no emotional investment in this. <laughs> uh, I so watching the trailer and reading about him, he he seems like a pretty standard Apex character. He's got a, his ultimate is like a massive mother load bomb that he launches out of a, it looks like an RP or like a minigun kind of like underarm rocket launcher, which is probably going to be used. I doubt it's going to be an especially powerful like damage dealer ability, but it's going to be good for crowd, not cr- maybe crowd control, but also just m- placing your enemies. Uh, he's got an air burst grenade, which is his active ability. I don't know what his passive is. He was announced. He's had two trailers thus far. He had the reveal, which was the Good as Gold trailer, which was bad. Uh, and then he had a secondary one, which came out, when was it? I think it was on th- either Thursday or Friday evening, which was much better. Huh. Admittedly, I haven't really been keeping too close of a tab on Fuse. As soon as he's launched in February, I'm going to be actually playing him and seeing what he's about. That's part of season eight, eh? Yeah, it is season eight. That, geez, that game's been out for over two years now. That's yeah, why I mean, they, they take a lot of time between seasons, don't they? That's about three months. I think, like, isn't that fairly standard? Uh, maybe for, for Destiny 2. But I mean, like, if you look at Fortnite, I mean, geez, that game just barrels through through content. That is fair. Fortnite has been out much. Well, yeah, I don't know if Fortnite's content is season based, but it's definitely like they do a lot more cosmetic updates. Like this, this week we had both the Predator and Terminator. <laughs> Terminator. <laughs> Termina? Terminator. The Terminator. Wow, that's that was that's that's the, the dumbest mm-hmm. thing I've said in a long time. And I and I started this podcast saying <laughs> Hitman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean Fortnite got 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 Predator and the Terminator this week. It's turning into a weird ready, as Noel said, a weird ready <laughs> player one game. I, th- I think that they're, they're even teasing that there's going to be a Tomb Raider skin soon. For God's sake, I just. It just never stops. You know, I, I, I don't know if I'm even mad about it. I just don't care. You, you know, at, at this point, I wouldn't even be surprised if they make skins of us for Fortnite. I mean, that's... Okay, well, just tell them about the deal we have going with Epic. Like, it's not like there's an NDA or anything. Shut up. Just, 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 just like, let it, <laughs> let it drop. Just drop it, down. We can talk about it with Epic. Everyone... Right? Listen, Fortnite's going to be basically like a digital version of Funko Pops. <laughs> Everyone's going to get a skin. That's very good. That's a very good analogy, actually. For, for, Fortnite <laughs> is just online Funko Pops. That's amazing. Hey, what happened to that Funko Pops Gears of War game? Did, did that even come out? I don't know. I... Was it was it a game? I'm fairly certain it was a game. Or well, some sort of strategy game, wasn't it? I think it? so. It completely flew underneath my, my radar because you had Gears 5, which was superb. You had Gears Tactics, even better. And then there was that other Gears game that no one really cared about. It's a mobile game. Give me a second. I'm looking it up. Um, Gears Pop on on the on the Google Play Store. Yeah, here it is. I am not a big fan of Funko Pop to anyone listening. I, I absolutely despise those things. I, I am largely I, I no i'd be lying if i said i didn't have three just because they yeah. were most of them yeah you know, they were actually all gifts from people so i, I can't exactly i think th- there's a documentary on youtube about the destructive habit of collecting funko pops i'm like oh why would you guys spend so much money on these little plastic critters and then i you know lift my head up to my I'm show. literally about to call you out on this <laughs> It's literally about to do it, and you did for me. The, the big difference here is that my toys are at least cool. Your t- your toys are much cooler. I just there, mm. there's something about the Funko Pop. Funko Pops look better when they're not doing like actual people because the just like solid black eyes just look dead, and I don't oh, like that. Looks like an X Files villain. Yeah. Whereas if you do like so the three I've got I've got a I've got a Batman I've got a Deadpool and I've got a Spider Man Noir. And they don't look terrible because, you know, those eyes, the eyes on all of those costumes, they don't have pupils. Which... That being said, I've, I've cast my gaze towards the QMX figures. I'm like, oh, it's like Disney Infinity, both more licenses. Oh, I want them. QMX figures? Oh, dude, just, just look them up. QMX Gargoyles, QMX Darkwing Duck, QMX Batman who laughs with a bunch of homicidal robins at his feet. Okay, I'm looking up QMX Darkwing Duck because I... 
I've heard Dark rumors Queen that Duck. I've heard rumors that there might be a um a, a, a reboot of that because Ducktales yeah. did fairly well. Yeah, because you you will see a few episodes of the new Ducktales, so that'll be interesting. Yeah. Oh wow, that actually does look amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see what I mean? See yeah. What I mean? Look really, at the really uh, QMX Batman who laughs. Okay. Uh, you, if you if you want me to do that, you're gonna have to fill the dead air while I type it in. Okay. Uh, I better say something interesting right now. You better so... say something interesting right now. Okay, now you find uh, your hook. My internet's much faster woo, than I thought it was. That was close. I had to be entertaining for a second there. Oh, wow. <laughs> that does look really good, actually. I know, right? With the three Robins as well. Oh, that's I know, that's fantastic. so cool. Oh, and the, and the ha-has are part of the statue. I thought those were just you, like... Do you, do you also get such a big Disney Infinity vibe? From I it? do. They are very Disney Infinity. Oh, dude, I, I saw more on the uh, demise of Disney Infinity because just imagine the end game figures we could have had. If oh, man, still um, I, I still at one point when I can find it, someone selling them secondhand want to buy a lot of those like Disney figures because especially the Marvel and Star Wars ones because I think they look so cool. Oh. I love I love that little... I love the art design for those. They're so basic, but so nice. I mean, if, if I was Disney, I would have said, you know, like, okay, this, this game business isn't profitable, but maybe we should just keep selling those toys at these. I mean, there's, there's money to be made People there. will collect, oh yeah, people will collect those toys. Yeah. I mean, and that's just Skylanders, because, <laughs> uh, so we, we, we found a whole lot of Skylanders figures at the, at the office, and I didn't realize how dirty they did Spyro, hey? Oh, I've never really gone to Skylanders. Look, look up the, the, the Spyro Skylanders statue that they did it is horrifically ugly wow i don't know who thought it was a good idea he looks like a he looks like a dragon that was illustrated for a fantasy novel in the 70s ooh. it's horrifically bad that is oh you can't take back those words no i can't and i and i refuse to i'm not going to you can't make me <laughs> i can't believe how quickly skylanders grew and failed I mean, it was it was fairly successful for about three or four years, wasn't it? Yeah, they just it just died. I mean, that, I mean, that... okay, f- fails a harsh word, but I mean, it, it just it died. I mean, you can't dispute that. I was always under the impression that Activision pulled the plug uh, at the right time, so they had made what they could and got out ahead of the game. Mm, but um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe no, I'm wrong. No, I could I could actually get behind that. You know, they had a limited shelf life. They, like collectible toys always have a great start a fantastic rise and then they always you know inevitably tumble and if you're anything like nintendo you're still shoving amiibos out the door hey those things are bloody brilliant those things are great i really want to <laughs> like <laughs> justify spending 250 rand on an amiibo i probably would is that how much an amiibo costs uh last time i checked that's roughly what they cost if they cost less then i would have bought them i'm fairly <sighs> certain about that it's a lot. like it's 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 a lot for what you're getting right if it was maybe a bit more substantial than sure but I can't. I don't want to justify spending two hundred fifty rand on a little micro statue. Fair enough. Fair um. Enough. Anyway, the only things we still need to talk about is we need to we need to confirm the name, which I suppose we already have. Uh, we got ahead of that one. The official name of this podcast going forward is going to be the Critical Hit Critcast, which actually rolls off the tongue fairly well now that I've said it all collectively. I like it. I mean, is it going? Is, is it just going to be Critcast? I just well, let's confirm this. Is it just going to be the Critcast, or is it going to be Critical Hit? You know. Critical I, hits, I like crit just cost. saying crit cost. I mean, that, that right there, it, it says a lot. Crit cost. I mean, comes off their tongue quite crit nicely. Cost, yeah. You don't need to add critical hit You're to right. that because everyone's going to associate crit with critical. So there we go. Crit cost. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. The crit cost. Going ahead, this episode will, well, this episode will probably be called the crit cost because that's going to be changing very soon. But yes, the show is going to be called The Critcast going forward. Thank you, everyone, for weighing in and uh, helping us out uh, figuring out a name. And uh, absolutely no thanks to everyone who didn't vote for Turbo Goose. Yep, listen, we need to have a serious discussion. Guys, we asked you to do one thing, and that one thing was to call it Turbo Goose, and you didn't do that. You let and, us down. And I, I feel like it's only fair that you go sit in the corner, turn your back. No, turn your back. Do it now. Just give him a second, Darren. <laughs> Okay, now turn your back. Good, sit there. Now you're gonna have to listen to the show with your back. You sit in the no, don't look, don't look at me. Turn back. <laughs> okay, now you have to listen to the rest of the show in that corner. Yeah, stay on your stool. Time out. Fifteen minutes. Good. This is this is parenting, and if, if quite frankly, if no one's done it to you yet, then this is long overdue. You are so lucky that we that we aren't rich enough to own belts. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. <laughs> 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 Um, so while you're sitting in the corner, if you have any questions, any thoughts that you would like to share with us, please 
uh, feel free to get in contact with us on, on Twitter or on the uh, post that goes live on the, in- on, the, on the internet, on the website, when uh, the show is up on Tuesdays. Uh, f- please feel free to share. Um, any ponderances or anything you would like asked, we will try our best and answer. Uh, between the two of us, we have some experience in the realm of the video game industry. I'm sure we can figure something out. There is scientific proof that we might know what we, we are talking about. We might know about. what we're talking about. Or we could just talk f- about... Uh, d- give me a topic, quick. Uh, Final Fantasy VIII? We could talk about Final Fantasy VIII for, for 30 <laughs> minutes. Which, again, I just want to just take a quick second to congratulate Darren for really restraining himself for only talking about that in the second episode of the show. Because I really thought that was a first episode topic. Oh, you should have seen the vein bulging on my head. My face was going <laughs> red. I've cracked my teeth from from, from clenching. Them. Like, as you, as, you, as you press stop on the record, like, you close the computer and just had to turn around and scream into a pillow. Final Fantasy VIII! Oh, I was, I was right there going, oh, Rino was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, if you could, we don't pay to advertise the show, so if you could uh, share us around, drop us a follow, and just tell your friends about it. Uh, we obviously want to get into as many years, years. We would like to get into many, uh, both ears and years as possible. Mm. Uh, and you know, if you enjoy the show, that'll be a great, uh, great solid you'll be doing us. You can find us on criticalhit.net. You search that on Facebook and Twitter. It'll show us. Uh, as well but uh, yeah i think that's about it darren any any closing thoughts any closing remarks anything you're playing this week i was thinking that if you listen to 10 podcasts the 11th one will be free we've got to give, give these guys a little stamp book that's book. fair yeah and, and the 10th one will be free and the 10th one you also get a free uh, coffee as well yeah for, if you come visit us if you come home. visit us we'll give you a free coffee if you listen to 10 in a row and you can prove you listen to 10 in a row you might get him you might even win a free ticket to critcon 2022 which will be held from the luxurious location of my mom's kitchen i can't wait i've heard such amazing things about your mom's kitchen i know i might get jeff keely to host it this time i mean at this point that sounds like actually very possible <laughs> that but is... yeah this is it from from me thank you guys we love you goodbye goodbye thank you for listening